All right. Um, so, and then the subsequent class to that, we started, or the past class, we talked about one of the um, tools in R to visualize data. Um, we'll, I'll do like a little, I'll go back over that content a little bit, add a little bit more um, in this lecture, and then we'll also talk um, a little bit more about, uh, I guess we're going to do the reading, reading data in, a little bit of reading data in. So just a little review from last class. This is actually all the code we wrote from last class. Um, we had this data frame called Iris that was already in the uh, available in R. Um, it's a data frame is just a kind of um, you can think of it as a spreadsheet, something with rows and columns. Columns have all the same sort of data kind in it. Um, and we wanted to plot some aspects of that. There's the built-in plots that are not super great, um, but we started working with ggplot. So if you had to install it, you run this. Otherwise, you just run the um, loading it into the current session to be available. So running this code means that all the functions that the ggplot2 package um, provides become available to you right in your R session. So one of those functions is the ggplot function. I showed you um, the building up of a plot. We decided that we wanted to do the same plot, the petal length versus petal width, um, as a scattergram, scatter plot, so lots of points. Um, and I showed you how to build that up by creating multiple objects and then adding them together at the end. So, for example, we created this thing arbitrarily named my canvas. Um, we put into it the uh, the result of a call to ggplot, which actually isn't anything. In fact, if I run this part and I say print my canvas, it prints a blank page in the plot area. So it, I mean. I said this is arbitrarily named my canvas, but it's uh, I use that word to remind myself that this is just going to be sort of initial blank canvas that ggplot is going to later sort of build on. So we can add some more layers. So I use the geom point function to create a set of instructions for how to um, draw on this blank canvas. So you. The arguments to geom points that we use, there's a data argument, a mapping argument, and then there's a couple other arguments that allow you to specify sort of fixed attributes of uh, the points that are being drawn. The, um, or, yeah. So uh, the, the data argument simply specifies what, where to find the um, data that you're going to be referring to. The mapping argument is more critical. It's telling you that um, for points, the aesthetic attribute named x, which we know is the location on the x-axis that that point's going to be drawn, should be a function of whatever it finds in the petal length column. And it's going to look for petal length within whatever we give it as a data um, argument here. Ditto. For the y attribute of geom point, it's going to look in the, that's going to vary as a function of what the petal width column says. Ditto color of the points is going to vary as a function of what um, it finds in the species column. When we, so x, it's going to create an x axis, obviously, y, it's going to create a y axis, obviously, color, it's going to, if it finds different um, values in the species column, or yeah, in that data frame, it will color each level of species differently, and it will create a little legend off to the side. Um, and then, as I said, finally, we specify some aesthetic attributes that don't vary as a function of the data. They're just we just want to specify some non-default values for these. So alpha was the transparency. Um, we told it 0.5 that alpha can go from zero to one. We told it 0.5 so that each point is semi-transparent. That way, if points overlap one another, we could, that'll be a darkening, and we can see that. Um, and we change the size here to an arbitrary thing, 10, just to explore that. Um, so having created the points layer, still nothing happens. So if I run this, and I go, so it runs geom point, 
the geompoint function and puts its result into an object called points layer. But if we look in our environment, um, points layer is not, doesn't actually have like anything in it. The plot hasn't really changed. Even if we say uh, print points layer, and I'll make this big and push it up so that you can see it. Um, it hasn't changed the plot at all. And it hasn't, um, like the actual, what's pointed out the screen is kind of a summary of what we wrote in our code. Um, it just doesn't look like our code. Um, so what has to happen next, if we want to actually show something on the screen, is that we have to combine the blank canvas object with a point slayer object. Um, and that's what we do below. But before we do that, we do a little bit of extra object creation. We create yet another object, call it label layer. And in it, we put the results of running the labs function. So the labs function. Um, set the labels for anything that it finds. Um, well, if you say X, it will label the X axis, whatever you put there. If you say Y, it will label, if you use the Y argument, it will label the Y axis of whatever it finds there. And ditto, if you say color, any um, legend it produces that uh, is mapped to, is telling you what the um, color to data mapping is, it will give whatever you put on the right side of the equals there. We've put just empty quotes there, which will mean that it will have no title. Um, so having created that label layer, again, that still doesn't do anything. Looking at our plots, nothing's there. Um, if we say print label layer, um, it prints out something. So this looks like a list of labels, but um, that's not super useful yet. What becomes useful is when you start adding these different objects together. So here I put the addition splitting on into different rows. Uh, so you can have my plot equals my canvas. And when R sees the plus, it knows to continue to look at the next lines um, for the next arguments, or so, or for the next parts of the computation that the computation is not done. If I just put my canvas like that, and then I put um, plus points layer, plus label layer, kind of like the way I like to put the commas at the beginning of the um, arguments whenever we're inside a call to a function. Um, this isn't going to work because it's going to get to the end of this line, see that there's nothing. It'll think that there's no more left to compute. And so it will sort of put whatever it finds to the right of the equals up to the end of the line, do that computation, whatever is there, and put it right into my plot, move on to this. Uh, line and see it just says plus points layer and it's going to give me an error. So actually I'll even do that. Run. So I'll run all three lines and as you see it uh, it runs that first line and sort of it sees thinks that it's all done its computations so you get another uh, sort of ready for computation character there. And once it starts looking at this, it says invalid argument to unary operator. That's not really a useful error message. But the reason why that happened was because um, what we actually wanted was to chain these lines together. And the only way to do that is by putting a plus at the end to kind of to, and R will then sort of be able to detect that you're intending to continue the computation on the next line. So if we add these all together, and again, it's kind of weird to think of R is looking at these as computations, but what we've done is created sort of instructions and lists. Um, so that's what ggplot is doing behind the scenes, is it's um, combining these together in ways that uh, will create a plot. So this has created the, can the taking the blank canvas, added the points layer, 
change the labels as directed by the uh, label layer um, and put it all into an object called my plot. Still though, nothing's plotted up here, so we need to actually show that plot, which can be achieved by simply calling the print function. And that will show uh, the plot. So this was one of the plots that we created the other day. Those the sizes of the dots are probably less useful, probably be better to put the dots as smaller. Um, but you notice here it's got the label that we wanted on each axis here and the absent label that we requested here. We could save that specific plot either through the point and click interface in the uh, plots panel up here or if we are doing lots of plots um, in a given our session we don't want to do lots of pointing and clicking. It's better to actually put code that explicitly tells, um, explicitly does the saving. So um, that's an example of how you do that. You can say what plot you want, what file you want, what its width should be. And I actually said length here. Uh, those who might have been following along in class and trying it afterwards, um, this was an error. It's actually height. Um, if you put length, it would have given you an error. In fact, let me do it. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see the error. It says, saving an image with these dimensions, error in this unused argument length equals four. Um, it's a little, I guess, still not super useful in uh, telling you directly what the problem is, but you can... Uh, someone in, so this part is a little bit confusing. This part, length argument, unused argument, um, length equals four. So we can kind of infer that something's wrong with that. Um, and if we went and did help on GG save, we could see in the list of arguments, Width and height are there, but length isn't there. So that's how I would infer from that error message that that saying length equals four was bad, and I should have said height equals four. Run that. Oops. And it's saved. If I actually look in my files area here, um, there's that plots folder, and there's the um, little PDF that's being created. Um, I can actually show you. Let's see if I click it and I download. So remember, this is running R off in a server somewhere. So if I sell it to export and download, and I'll open that in a file viewer, there's a PDF of it. So you could copy that into whatever word processing program you use. That was created when I um, specified the value of the file argument. So I called it fig1, I could have called it figure1, I could have called it uh, plot1, etc. Um, whatever, or just one, um, whatever name you want to call that file. That goes there. This plots slash means that um, I want to put that file in whatever the current working directory is. Remember up here in the console, that's the current working directory, um, but inside a folder named plots. Now, if that folder didn't exist, let me delete it. If that folder didn't exist, I'm actually curious what happens. Will it make that folder? No. It says cannot open file plots slash one PDF. Um, we don't know why it can't open that file, so you kind of have to do, again, some sleuthing to go look at your files, or your, uh, the folder that is the current working directory, and having seen here, oh, go away dictionary, uh, having seen here that there's no already created folder named plots, you'd have to remember to just create that, and now it will run just fine, and if we go in there, there's that. Can we retrieve the any folder or file? Ah, um, there's no undelete in this. I wonder if 
nope, there's no undelete. So uh, be careful with using this file area to delete things because there's no undelete. Ba -ba -ba. All right. Uh, all in one line, that's completely fine. I put it separately here just to kind of be so when I put it up on the screen, it's easier to see what's going on without having to resize this uh, window. Um, it's also kind of useful to see that this is multiple things being put on. Um, but you do have to remember to put the pluses at the end. Um, so I showed you, let's see, with this geom point, um, I showed you that if you were to go to help, and type in help geom point and scroll past the first little bit to the details area. Um, there's a section that tells you all the aesthetic attributes that you can use to convey um, information from your data. So we've already, I mean, X and Y are the obvious ones that you have to use, um, but we've already used color to differentiate different, um, different species type. So we could use any of those aesthetic attributes to sort of provide information about the data. There's another way that we can sort of show a separation of data, different sort of classes of our data. Um, and that is without, so what I'm gonna do is uh, not color the different points by species. So I'll just go ahead and delete this line. Um, but instead, I'm going to create yet another object. So I'm actually, so I'll sort of start from the top. I'll run this. Um, and in fact, I'll run all of it just to show you that now I've gotten rid of that differential coloring of the different species. Notice here, now that I've got no, I didn't ask it to color di different points for different species. We now no longer have that legend there. Um, and even though I've got a label layer object created where I've said color equals something. Um, when it combines all these things together, it's going to recognize that color wasn't used to convey anything about the data anyway. So it doesn't matter that we have this here. Um, but what I want to do is show you a different way of um, Sure. differentiating the visual as a function of what is um, some property of the data, which is to create a faceting. So, um, so I'll call it a facet layer, and I will produce something that is, let's see, what is the better way to do this? Uh, facet uh, grid. So this facet layer is going to split the plot into multiple plots. Um, actually, I won't do facet grid yet. I'll do facet wrap. There's two faceting functions, and they do things slightly different, differently. Um, all right, so I'm actually going to pull up the help on facet wrap because I forget the name of that first argument. Facets. Oh, good, easy. So, the first argument is named facets, and what this wants is um, a list of variables again that it'll find in the data um, that it's going to use to split the plots into separate plots. So I can put species here. Um, I'm actually curious if this will work as is. So. I'm going to run this. Ah. Um, all right. So it's going to get an, if you run it just as is like this, it's going to get an error. Object species not found. Well, that's a little strange. Back when we created this geom point, we provided something called data, and that kind of let this other function, AES, find where the pedal length it, the, it told this function, AES, where to look when we give it a name of a column. Um, if I look at the help 
for facet, amongst the different arguments, I don't see any data argument. So facet is not set up in the same way. The way facet works um, is it's expecting as the argument um, to our first, um, well, let's actually look at what that facets argument or yeah, argument is supposed to be either a formula or a character vector. Um, okay, let's try a character vector. Or we can just put a, a character vector can be just a single, um, a single sort of entry that is a character string. So let's try that. All right. So. I had to put the name of the column that I wanted to use as a faceting variable in quotes. So let's now use this layer. So we can just take our existing layering computation here and add a new one, facet layer. And if we run all three, ta-da! We get a plot where each sort of species type gets its own sort of subplot. It's got the title of the species type up top here, um, but otherwise they have their own subplot. Let's see. Now if you wanted to do multiple, um, if you wanted to do multiple variables, so let's actually look at the iris data set. Um, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, species. Uh, this actually isn't a very good example. Um, let me use well, I mean there's another way to do um, this to get the same plot using facet wrap. Instead of putting facets in quotes here as so it says it could be a character vector, which is what it is when we do this facet equal species, or a formula. What does it mean when it says a formula? What it means is that um, I can leave species without the quotes around it, so long as I put the squiggly line in front of it, the tilde character. The tilde character in R is used to say that something is a formula something a formula is about to start. Um, this gets useful when you want to um, put something that uh, is more than one thing here. I mean, you technically this is one less character to type than quotes around species, but um, if you had another variable in this data set, um, say, uh, well, they're all gonna be the same genus. Um, Maybe the flowers are at two different locations or something. You could say species plus location. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take this opportunity to show you guys a little bit of um, how to modify data. So I've got this object called Iris. If I look at it here as sort of a spreadsheet, it's got these. Um, and for the first uh, bunch, 50, it's Satosa. For the next 50, it's another, oh, yeah, Verisicolor. And for the final 50, it's Virginica. So I'm going to add something that's going to say within each species, Call the first 25 location A and the next 25 location B. Um, let's see, what way do I want to do this? Uh, so, iris location. So, again, this dollar sign means uh, look in the thing at the left hand side and now refer to the columns with the name on the thing on the right hand side. If we want to create a new column, we still use that dollar notation, but um, what it will see is it will look on the thing on the left hand side 
and well, if I put an equal sign here and then some computation over here, it's going to come to this line, it will see the equal sign, it will do whatever computation is on the right hand side, and then it will try to assign into the left hand side. So how does it do that? It sees that there's a dollar, it looks for the data frame called this, and it will assign into a column called this. If there's already a column called that, um, it will just replace what's in that column already. If there isn't, it will create a new column and append it to the end of the, um, of the data frame there. So what computation am I going to do over here? Uh, um, I'm going to, what I want to do is I want to, again, I want 25 A's and then 25 B's to make it so that Satosa has 25 A's and then 25 B's. And then I want to do that again, 25 A's and then 25 B's, and then yet again, 25 A's, 25 B's. So these uh, locations, what you're talking about, like A's, B's, it will be, I'm sorry, if you add column there, will that data? Yes, so I'm just putting a character string A. Um, it's as if I were to create a new column if this were a spreadsheet, and I'd say, I want the entry in this column to be A, 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 until I get down to 25, and then B, 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 until I get down to 50, and then, so I'm gonna be doing something sort of repetitious here. Um, so I'm gonna use the rep function. I'll look at help. Look at rep a little bit here. So the first argument to rep is something called x. Um, so if I want, uh, so x is the things that you want to repeat. So I want a's to be repeating and b's to be repeating. Another argument to rep is each. Um, I'm surprised it doesn't list it right there. Uh, Further arguments to be passed from other methods. So times is there. So a little annoying in just the way the help documentation is written. Um, it just says dot dot dot. So if we look down to dot dot dot, we see that times um, is available, length out, and each is available. So the, if I say, so I want A to be put 25 times and B to be put 25 times. So each one of these, I want to be repeated 25 times. Now, I actually know that the it needs to do that process of putting A 25 times and B 25 times. It needs to repeat that three times. So I would say times equals three. So if I run this, going to run the command. It's not going to print anything out because all we've said is to sort of create this new column and we haven't asked it to print any output. But if I click back over to this, um, oh, that's something that I didn't know. I typically don't look at data using this area here. Um, but good to know is that it doesn't automatically update. So I guess I have to, ooh, let me just type view, oops. I'll do it in my code. If I say u virus, again, it will open this up, but now it will be updated. So we have got a new column called location. That column has 25 A's, and then it switches to doing B. And then it switches back over to A once it's done B is 25, and it just repeats. So we've got the nice repeating values as we wanted. And the only reason I'm creating this fake data is that I, so that I can show you and now another feature. If we, for example, happen, if this happened to be real data and we had um, species measured at different locations, how would we reflect that in the plot that we just had where we have um, here this now 
technically combines the two different location, um, that location information. So how would we include that location information in the um, creation of this facets layer? Well, um, ba -ba -ba. I'm going to start again from the top. Run this. Yeah. Yep. So I showed you before, if we just wanted species, you could have species with a tilde at the front, or you could put, um, oops, da, da, da. or you could put it in quotes. Um, I actually wonder. If I wanted to tell this, put both species and um, location, location again, that new column that we created, Maybe I can just pass it a um, a vector of character labels. So let's try it. So I'll run this to create that new facet layer. I'll rerun that to combine them all again. And it actually has done that. So that's probably the best way to do it. There's another way that, I mean, this was, you had to put the quotes around it and you had to put the comma and the C and everything. There's a slightly, different, like, less typing way of doing it. If you did species plus location and a tilde at the front, that would produce the same thing. Um, and I'll just show you, demonstrate that that's the case. Um, so same plot as before. Um, so if you felt like doing it that way, go for it. Um, it's that requires you sort of understand and remember this formula type stuff. Better to stick with the simpler, just conceptually idea of having just a list of the things you want to split by here. Now, notice it has put them before we just had three columns. So maybe you were expecting, so this was the three columns, maybe you're expecting now six columns, but what has actually happened is it has uh, created a table. It's three columns in one row and three columns in another row. So it's as if we had those six columns, but it's wrapped around and put it at a new level. So that's actually why facet wrap, uh, what facet wrap means um, is it has wrapped things around. Um, you can control how it wraps by, let me go back to the help facet wrap by telling how many rows and columns that you want. So here it said it's the def by default it has what are actually the defaults? It, do it has null defaults so presumably there's some sort of internal logic that de determines what it decides to put in terms of um, rows and columns. Uh, if we wanted to be explicit about how many rows and columns, say we wanted to say n rows equals three, that means that n calls has to be two. Um, so we actually could just omit this. So if we run that, it will reshape things a little bit. Um, is n rows not? I'm gonna scroll up because I think, yeah. Sometimes when you select a whole bunch of code and at the end you get something that isn't what you maybe were expecting, scroll back up and see if you actually encountered errors. Um, so here actually, there it says unused argument, n rows equals three. So something went awry with this n rows. Anybody see it? And row, yep. So that's a common mistake for myself and lots of others is some things are pluralized, some things aren't. So I'll run that again. And we get now a little bit more sensical output because before when we had just the default and letting it figure out how to arrange things and wrap things, it said Satosa A, Satosa B. It varies the color A, but then varies the color B is way down here. Um, in Virginica A, Virginica B, um, if we explicitly tell it in row three, um, 
it's going to explicitly put Setosa A, Setosa B, Verzicolor A, Verzica B, Virginica A, Virginica B. So that has a little bit nicer output to it. So facet wrap, you can ask it to put sort of an arbitrary number of um, variables that then just combines to create this grid of plots, depending on sort of, you could actually ask, tell it and row equals one. I'll run that. And it's just sort of put them all in one row. So you can sort of have arbitrarily shaped data from arbitrarily number of variables. Um, there's a different way of doing faceting. I'll call this, I'll, I'll copy this, and I'll call this other thing, um, other facet layer. And I'll delete some of the stuff on the inside. And instead of facet wrap, I'm gonna say facet grid. So here, facet grid, uh, let me look up the help on it. It too has a first argument called facets. But if I look down at the arguments for facets, um, it explicitly wants a formula. So it says a formula with the rows on the left-hand side, LHS, and the columns on the right-hand side. So it's a formula, so it wants a tilde, but we're allowed to put stuff on the left-hand side of the tilde and the right-hand side of the tilde. The stuff on the left-hand side are going to say what is going to be used to split the plot into rows of panels, and the right-hand side is going to be what is going to be used in the plot to split it into columns of panels. So let's put species as rows and location as columns. Again, because we're using tilde here and it's a formula, we don't have to put quotes around these. So we've got two faceting layers here that we've created. You can only use one or the other when you start combining things together. So I'm going to change this from facet layer to other facet layer when I run this. You can create them both and have them sort of stored in your environment, but you can only create a given plot with one or the other. So if I run that, it does what we had before. Now notice it's actually labeled things a little bit differently. We've got, um, let me actually scroll back to when we had this version. It included the names of both variables in the top of each panel. Um, but here, it sort of saved a little, using fast.grid has saved a little bit of space by just labeling the columns and labeling the rows at at their edges. So facet grid is a little bit uh, nicer that way. What if I actually didn't want to, what if I only had one uh, variable that I wanted to use in this? Well, you could just use facet wrap. Um, the other way of doing it is to, uh, the variable that you don't want here, say I just wanted the rows to be differentiated by species, but I didn't want any columns. I just wanted one column. Um, I can't just leave it empty there. I have to put something. The thing I can put though is a period. So if I run that, it's going to create a grid with species as defining what the rows of panels are gonna be, but nothing defining what the columns are, therefore just a single column. Run that, single column, with all the stuff there. Similarly, if I wanted species to be on the, to uh, separate the columns of panels, I'd put a period on the row side of the period, meaning nothing. So when you have a single variable, you can use either facet wrap or facet grid. Um, it's up to you. When you have two variables, I tend to use facet grid so that I can map them and they have those nice, um, slightly more efficient labels at the end of um, the columns and rows. 
Um, if you've got lots of variables, then facet wrap is probably going to be better for you. Um, so is that what they do? They have to have some different variables so they need to have to lock if you don't make a dot. For example, if you remove the dot and yeah. that sign. Let's try it. Work. So if I do this, I think it okay, no error. Interesting. I would have expected an error. And, oh, what? Let me try. Um, no dot that way. Ha. Okay. I would have expected both ones to give us a, an error. Um, for some reason, only the one where it's a tilde without something on the right-hand side is giving us an error, um, so that you don't have to remember which one is which. Probably best to always remember to put a dot regardless of where it is. Uh, ba -ba -ba. So that's faceting. Um, faceting, I mean, can be useful in some cases. Usually it's better to use the aesthetic attributes of the um, geometric object that you're plotting to differentiate different um, aspects of your data. I'm going to copy some of this and start creating it down here because uh, I don't want to overwrite what we already have here. So I'm going to copy that, and I'll start pasting it below so that I have the code already saved for creating these plots. So let's see. So what I want to do next, so I've shown you the geom point. Uh, let's explore some of the other geometric objects. Um, so some of other geometric objects that actually um, are also useful. What if I wanted just a histogram of um, the lengths? So what is a histogram? Let me actually first, I'm going to show you quickly a plot that's the original plot without this faceting stuff going on. So here's that original plot. Now, if I wanted a histogram of petal length, this is a bivariate plot, a dot plot, scatter plot of petal width and petal length. If I wanted a histogram of petal length, you can imagine a histogram as what you would happen if each of these dots actually just fell down to their respective value on the x-axis, and you were to have you to create little bins to catch each one, and you then just count how many are in this bin, how many are in this other bin. So that's what a histogram does. Um, you can think of the creation of a histogram, you, you're taking the raw data and you're doing some procedure to it and you sort of have a reduction of that raw data instead of all those different points in their locations. We're getting a set of bins and counts in the bin. So behind the scenes what ggplot is doing is um, if we ask for geom histogram, it's doing a statistical transformation of the data and that specific, specific statistical transformation is going to be binning. So if you actually notice in the geom histogram help, well, I'll go up to the help. Uh, geom histogram. In the help um, for, well, this shows uh, help for a number of functions, one of which is geom histogram. There's the mapping argument that we know about. There's the data argument that we know about. There's a stat argument called bin. So this is showing us that the, that geom histogram as a geometric object is behind the scenes doing a statistical transformation of the data. Um, ditto if we were actually to go back and see geom point. Is there any statistical transformation that it's doing? There is a stat argument but it's identity, and the identity stat means don't do any statistical transformations, just 
to show the raw data. So using, let's use the geom histogram. Um, by default, it's going to do the binning all for us. So all we have to do is create a blank canvas. I'll take out this print statement. That was just to show you that it truly is just a blank thing. Um, we're going to create something, let's call it uh, bins layer. Um, well, maybe I'll just call it hist layer. So hist layer is going to create the histogram geometric object, which takes the data as specified to its data argument. Um, it's going to do the aesthetic mappings of the columns um, to the uh, properties of a histogram. So the histogram has one sort of critical property, which is what's on the x-axis. Um, what's on the x-axis, we want petal length on the x-axis. Um, we don't really need these two arguments there. There is an alpha argument to GM histogram. That's just going to make each block differently uh, transparent. There's a size. Uh, I don't think there is a size for, um, attribute for histogram. Uh, and I'm going to take off these labels. Uh, or maybe I'll leave the X one on because that is what we're graphing still. Certainly going to take off the facets. And when I combine things together, I'm going to take off this facet. And I need to remember to take off this final plus so that label layer is the last thing that I'm adding. All right, so again, creating a blank canvas. Good call. OK, yeah. Hist layer. All right, so creating a blank canvas, creating a geometric histogram, um, or creating a geometric object that is a histogram, um, creating a label layer, and then adding them all up to then print. All right, so we've got a print out here. Looks like a histogram. Um, we've also got some output, actually, when we called the print. There wasn't output when we first added them together, but when we called this print function um, on the object, uh, it gave us a little warning here. Um, stat bin, using bins equals 30, pick better value with bin width. So what this is telling us is that whenever you do a histogram, you need to make a choice of how big the bins are going to be. Um, so it has, um, well, equivalent to saying how big the bins are going to be, you can also say how many bins do you want. So if you've got a range of, uh, I guess that's how this one's working, is it's saying um, across the range of values that the data takes, how many bins do you want? So particularly with histograms, that's actually one that's sort of fairly important. So let's explore changing the number of bins. By default, it's chosen 30. Maybe we want a different number of bins. So to change something that's about this, in the same way that if we wanted to change, um, say, the color of all the bins, we'd say here, uh, color equals, we could put blue there. Ours and ggplot are smart enough to know that when you put the color or the string blue, it's going to go to a lookup table that it has behind the scenes and find a nice blue color. Um, the same way that if we wanted to change sort of an aspect of the geometric object that's being plotted, we just put it right here. Um, that's not data dependent. Here, if we want to change an aspect of the statistical transform that's being done behind the scenes, um, here it happens to be binning that's being done behind the scenes. We can specify that here. Um, it's actually the uh, hint here, or the warning here, has explicitly told us that there's an argument that it's using behind the scenes called bins. So let's try that. Bins equals, and instead of 30, let's try 10. So fewer bins means bigger bins. Let's run all this sort of again. See if it works. And yes, it's worked. It's colored the outside of each one as blue. Um, but we also notice that there's fewer bins here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
10 across the range. So this demonstrates two things. First, when an object does statistical transformations behind the scenes, we can sort of tweak how those transformations are done um, by supplying some arguments to them. Um, another thing that this sort of demonstrates in the specific case of a histogram, um, it's actually a good idea to always plot, to look at it with multiple bin sizes. Um, so one cool thing is that um, we can actually do this in one plot. So here's a bin size of 10. I'm going to copy this. Um, I'm going to get rid of this color equals blue. Uh, and instead say, um, so color of the outside, that's not super useful. So I want to talk about the insides of these plots. Um, and so that's um, going to be fill. But actually, I think if I use the alpha argument, that will do what I want, which is I want to make all of these blocks semi-transparent. So I'm going to put them at 0.5. So I'm going to copy this little block of code, and I'm going to just paste it right there. So now if I have this, if I just ran it as is, it's just going to rerun the same code, and overwrite this object hist layer. So I'm going to create a new object called hist layer 2. And in hist layer 2, instead of bins equals 10, I'll say bins equals 20. So now I've got hist layer and hist layer 2. And in the same way that I added hist layer to the canvas here, I'll just copy it and add both hist layer and hist layer 2. So Starting from the top, I'll select all of this and run them. It runs through sequentially, creating hist layer and then hist layer two, and then adding them all together and showing the plot. So this shows both of them superimposed on each other, which is actually a nice way to simultaneously see sort of multiple bin choices. Um, I'm actually going to go crazy and do yet another one. Uh, yeah. Isn't it showing a different result altogether? Because we see the like, x axis and y axis, they are showing different values altogether. Yes, um, because the more bins you have, the less values will fall in a given bin. So as you add bins, it's going to decrease in uh, height. So you notice like it's decreasing in height. So, yes, this is one of the reasons. Okay. As, as you make more bins, you get less numbers in any given bin. So yeah, you're going to generally observe sort of the uh, smaller bins have lower bars. If I added yet another one, his 3, and made it bins equals 30, I'll add it here again. Do, do, do. Run it. It'll add yet more. And these are yet, again, sort of smaller. So I actually thought of this on the spot, but I'm actually kind of proud of it. I, I, it's always a good idea to look at histograms with different bin sizes. Um, I mean, if you're going to look at histograms altogether, there's some other visualization tools that allow you to talk about the distribution of how points are um, that are better than histograms. But for now, if you're going to look at histograms, you always should look at histograms with multiple bin size choices. Um, and having them overlaid on each other actually looks kind of cool. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah. So you can overlay any sort of um, data on top of each other. So if I wanted to take our points layer from earlier and just add that into our sort of adding up here, so I'll actually say points layer. It's not going to make a lot of sense, but you can do it. 
that's partly the point. Like actually, because those the the points for pedal width were all really low in the first place. Um, so what it's trying to do there is it's putting the taking the y values as we asked it to do when we originally created this. So pedal width, but all the values in that pedal width column are all really small. They're basically zero. So that's not super useful. Um, what might be useful is to actually put points. I'm going to copy this. And call points layer, or create a new object called points layer, overriding what we had before. With a call to geom point, point, yeah. Um, where I tell it where to put on x, and I give it, again, before we had it, x is dependent on data, and y is dependent on data. Here I'm saying y is just always going to be 0. So it will plot all those points along that line. Don't need bins, because bins is not an argument that geom points needs or expects. Um, I'm going to put the alpha down. Actually, they're going to be smaller as I plot this. So again, starting from the top here, I'll run all this. And it's going to look very similar. Um, they'll be smaller, of course, because I didn't tell it to have the big sizes before. And this time, although you couldn't really see it, they did have some jitter in the y dimension because they were being plotted a little bit off the y equals zero axis. Here, they're all being definitely plotted on the y equals zero. Um, and you can kind of see that the opacity, the darkness of these points, generally corresponds to the height of these bars. So that's actually a nice visual that, uh, yeah, to, again, if you're going to do some sort of histogram or representation of the density, it's a good idea to actually plot the points there and um, along the axis as well. Uh, 12.32. All right. Any questions so far on sort of this general idea? There are lots of cool um, geometric objects. Uh, I'll just... Uh, you would have seen it in the reading that you presumably would have done, uh, but I'll, I'll show another cool one. So we've got the points layer here. Again, we're, uh, let's go back up to the one where we wanted a bivariate plot or scatter plot, where we've got petal length on the x-axis and petal width on the y-axis. Uh, I'll just run this and create this plot. Da -da -da. Um, actually, I'm going to copy this again because I don't want to overwrite what I had before. I'll put it at the bottom, and I'm going to take out the facets because I don't want the facets. Take off the addition of the facet here. If I were to actually have this as code, I probably want to be naming each of these things different. So this would be sort of my canvas three points layer three, so that I wasn't overwriting things as I went. Um, I'm being a little bit lazy in showing it to you this way. Um, in your own code, whenever you sort of copy, whenever you find yourself copying and pasting the creation of objects, uh, probably means that you you can do that. You can paste, but remember to go back and change it to a new name so that you are um, sure of what objects you're using and when they were created and what they had in them when they were created. Here I'm being lazy, so. Creating a blank canvas, creating a points layer with all this information, uh, creating a label layer and adding them all together. And it should just be that, I don't like this size equals 10. I'm going to put it down to, well, I'll just accept whatever the default size is. So I'll select all that and run. And there's a plot that we had from the other day. Darkness implies that there's some overplotting. Um, I showed you that alpha is one way to get rid of this overplotting issue so that you can actually see that it's there. Um, another way is to add jitter to the data. That is, even though all these values are precisely on this point, give some random sort of jitter to them. You can do that in the data set itself, um, but it's probably better to let ggplot handle that because it will 
figure out how much jitter to add. Um, and it's actually nice in that um, the it actually has an argument. So G on point, um, although it doesn't do any statistical transformations, it does have an argument called position. And the values that it can take, let's actually bring up G on point. Uh, so there's stat equals identity, position equals identity. If it's identity, it's just going to take the data and put it at the position that the data says. Um, alternatively, position. Position adjustment, either a string or result of a call to a position adjustment function. Okay, that doesn't help very much. Um, to tell us some details. Some, where? Ah, okay. Uh, Aha, biggest problem in a scatter plot is overplotting. Whenever you have more than a few points, points may be plotted on top of one another. This can severely distort the visual appearance of a plot. There is no solution, no one solution to the problem, but there are techniques that can help. You can add additional information with GM smooth, GM quartile, GM density 2D. If you have a few unique values, GM box plot can also be useful. Alternative, you can summarize a number of points each. So um, another technique, so uh, none of these we're gonna talk about. It did give us the tip of using an alpha to make things transparent. Um, it hasn't told us about jitter. Um, Geom jitter. Well, it says here you can use jitter to avoid mild overplotting. Well, it hasn't. Yeah. Whoa, no. Okay. Um, Geom jitter. I was looking for a description of the different values that position can take. Um, I didn't find one there. I just happened to know that jitter is actually one of the um, values it can take. So again, down here, creating G on point. If I put in quotes jitter. So identity would, if I put identity here, that's the default value. It would just put things where the data say to put them. If I put jitter, it's going to put things where the data say to put them, plus a little bit of random noise that um, isn't going to sort of throw points dramatically away from where the data put, told them to be, but is going to allow us to see that there's points around that same location. So if I were to rerun this and go, notice the plot has changed a little bit. We've sort of, we still have the nice fact that that alpha transparency allows us to see points of overlap, um, but the points have like been moved around a little bit. So that's another tip for that. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to show you a cool one, which was a smooth. Uh, so we'll create a smooth layer. It doesn't matter where I in the code I create this, um, it will matter where I put it here, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, so smooth layer, geom smooth. So I'm gonna use the smooth geom. That wants the same arguments as up here, so I could say data equals iris. Mapping it, and it wants, the smooth is still asking for an X and a Y, um, but let's actually just see what it does when I put it on. So if I say my canvas plus points layer um, plus label layer, I'm going to add something right after the canvas um, smooth layer. All right. So it's going to create the points layer with some alpha, with some jitter. It's going to create the smooth layer, whatever that is. I haven't really told you what that is yet. It'll create the label layer and it will add them together and show them. The smooth layer. What is, ha what is new about this plot? We've got a blue line and if you kind of zoom in here, which actually I think I can do, you can kind of see that there's this kind of dark band here. Um, so what this has actually done is it's computed a, st a statistical model behind the scenes. Um, it's kind of looks like a linear fit, but it actually hasn't sort of fall off here. It's used a somewhat complicated thing called locally weighted regression. Um, low S is another name for it. Um, but it's a line that kind of fits through the data. It's not necessarily straight, 
um, but it's the blue line is sort of the prediction of that model and the um, band here is sort of the uh, confidence of its prediction of where that blue line should be. The blue line sort of implies like where the sort of the center of the data is as um, uh, as you go along the plot um, and the band implies the um, sort of your confidence about it. Correlation is always going to be strictly linear. So let's actually, so this is being one type. If we wanted to in, enforce a certain type of smoother, one of which is a strictly linear, um, let me go up to help. And I'll say geom smooth, because I actually can't remember how to do this. Stat, I think it's stat. Um, no, it is. I recall correctly, I say method equals LM, which is short for linear model. Let me run that bit. Yay! So a linear model is the same thing as a correlation with just two variables. Um, and that forces this line to be a nice straight line, if we wanted to. Um, one thing I want to show, uh, da, da, da. no, I won't. Go ahead. Aha, okay, let's actually ask, let's actually try to figure out like, how would I know what is going on here? Um, so geom smooth, let's go to the help for geom smooth. Okay, a smooth conditional mean. Um, geom smooth and stat smooth are effectively aliases. They both use the same arguments. Use geom smooth unless you want to display the results of a non-standard with a non-standard geom. Okay, so geom smooth. Um, Let's look down at its details. Oh, let's see, aesthetics, da, 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 computed variables, actually, maybe. Okay, so SE, I guess this is one of these where you happen, you, you might need to happen to have that information already. Um, S, if you were to start reading through all the arguments and what they do, you'd get to SE, display confidence interval around smooth. And that's what this band is. It's a confidence interval. So true by default, C level to control. So that means that there's another argument called level that will control what that is, level. Level of confidence interval to use. So what this band is, it's the 95% confidence interval. If you wanted to change that to um, say a 90% confidence interval or a 99% confidence interval, you'd use the level argument. So I'll indeed do that. Um, level equals 0.99, let's say. Da, da, da. Run and run this again. And in theory, did that actually go? Yes. Theory, if I zoom, make this big, try to see, will it be bigger? I guess, let me tell this one to go back, which I think forces this one to go back. No. Wow, in theory, this one will be wider. This isn't a case where the difference from 0.95 to 0.99 is very big, but um, in theory, that should have made that get bigger, wider. Okay, so you can tweak how the stat works with some parameters down here. The help kind of should guide you through that. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is we've got some redundant code here. At least we've got really repetitive code here. We've got 
a blank canvas, we're creating a geometric object that uses data iris and uses specific mapping. And then we create another geometric object that uses that same data and that same mapping. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to type this twice, but just type it once? So you can. It was kind of weird creating this empty object in the first place. Um, what we can do, what you're allowed to do, you don't have to, but you're allowed to, um, is to, if there's any data that is common across all your layers or mappings that are common across your layers, you can go ahead and put that right in your call to geom point. So I'll copy this so that we can sort of refer back to it. Um, and I'll put it down here. All right, so all I need to do is I'll just copy this little section here. Taking out all the first bits to geom point, so I want to take off the comma at the beginning of this because this is now the first argument. I'll open up the, geom, the ggplot function call and add in, copy in what we had before. So now that I've got this here, if we were just doing that points layer, I haven't saved myself any typing because just one layer, it's arbitrary whether I put the data in the call the GD plots or the call the G on point, did a mapping. But because we've got this other layer that we're adding on that shares all the same sort of information, shares those same lines, now we've saved ourselves a little bit of typing. So when we create my canvas, I'll run this just to prove that it works. It's going to create, or it's going to find the data and find this mapping and apply that to any other layers that we encounter. So having run all this, it gets the same output. So, uh, it looked visually like it changed a little bit. That's because I think the random jitter is different each time. Um, so yeah, if you've got lots of layers that are all referring to the same data, um, you can put the data there. Um, and if they're using the same mapping or if their mapping doesn't conflict with one another, you can put the mapping up in there too. So yeah, that's one way to make your code um, simpler to type. Sure. Now, another thing that I've done here is um, I've always been creating these objects, storing them away, and then finally at the end, I add them together and I print them. Yet another way of sort of making less typing for yourself. I'm gonna copy all this and put it up the, well, copy this much. I'm gonna put it down here. Is that, where'd it go? Yeah, okay. So starting here, um, if I just want to create the plot right away, so I say my plot is equal to ggplot, and instead of storing this away in something and adding it later, I add it right away. And again, instead of storing this smooth and adding it later, I add it right away. And finally, instead of storing this label, I add it right away. So this will then create my plot that I can then print. And it's the same, it's gonna be the same thing. Uh, but if you have an error in this coding, does it, can I tell you where is the error? Or uh, it out? Yeah, it will. Yeah, it, it will tell you sort of, well, Let's see, um, let's intentionally put an improper name. So it won't tell you really where, it'll give you some information that you can sort of search through. Um, there's no, I mean, the benefit of doing this is slightly less typing. In fact, people tend to do even less typing by not assigning this into an object, just running it right away in which case you don't need the print at the end. It will, by default, it will print. So just running that, we'll create a plot, run it again, it'll do plot again, run it again. 
it's different a little bit each time because of that random jitter that we're adding. Um, so this is what you'll see very commonly in the R for data science documents and elsewhere. Um, it's easier, slightly faster to type. Um, I like to teach by showing the more laborious way of um, having each layer on its own, has its own data, has its own mappings, um, and being assigned into a thing, and finally being combined together, because I I've found that people pick things up better that way. Um, it also somewhat reinforces that the layers don't have to be referring to the same data. You could have different data coming from different places that you can combine into the same plot, which is nice. Um, we won't really be encountering that. I've encountered that in other places in my work that yeah, was useful, but not here. All right. And so this is all I'm going to do for plotting. Um, we're going to go next to um, data, reading in data and manipulating data. Um, and then finally, we'll actually start talking about stats. Uh, we've talked about, I've, I've talked about, I use the word stats here and that there's statistical transforms when you're trying to do binning or this linear model, for example, that's a statistical model. Um, but we'll be talking about stats uh, either Thursday next week or the following, uh, where I'll first start talking about the philosophy of statistics because that is an underappreciated um, realm. Uh, and that will introduce the concept of Bayesian statistics, which most of you will not have been exposed to so far. And then we'll actually get into applying our our coding and plotting uh, expertise by which we'll have then to doing some real Bayesian data analysis um, of health-like data. All right.